Uncertainty, fear, guilt. These are just a few of the things a parent wakes up feeling every single day their child is missing. The emotional pain of the absence of that child, uncertainty and fear about that child's fate, and the guilt about not protecting the child from that fate. Lock up Johnny Jr. because we're about to take a trip into the pedophiles. There is an act that is so vile, so depraved, that it virtually goes beyond description. Lurking in the dark, musty shadows, so sick, so unimaginable, that no one wants to say its name. But when it rears its ugly head, it is allocated to the pedophiles. Tonight's episode, The Pedo Social Club. Yeah, I know. It got pretty dark pretty quickly. I apologize for that. I guess the Boxels were like any other middle-class family in the late 1980s. Yeah, sure, they had their ups. They had their downs as well. But overall, they were close. Peter Boxel described his son as a good kid, although a bit naive, always listening to the radio, trying to win one contest or another. But his true passion was football. And by all accounts, he was fanatical. And Lee's favorite local team was Sutton, attending every match he could. And as for school, although his attendance was regular, his teachers would tell you that he was average. Lee had a close, tight group of friends, and he had a crush on the girl who lived down the road, regularly offering to walk the family dog as an excuse to talk to her. By Lee's parents' own account, he woke up late Saturday morning. An interaction was brief with the father having to go out and run some errands. His mother had to take care of her sick mother. His youngest sister was going to stay at a friend's. Lee told his parents he was going into town to hang out with his best friend, and then he might go see a football match afterwards. Once in town, they hung out together till about one and then they parted ways with Lee, saying that he was gonna go watch a football match. And after that, Lee Boxel disappeared like a goddamn ghost. A football-loving English teenage ghost. didn't come home that night for dinner, Peter and Christine Boxel were scared. There's one thing they knew their son was, was dependable. And when they phoned the fish and ship eating cops, the cops told him not to worry. He'd be back soon. After all, he was a teenager, and he was most likely out there somewhere in a park with his face in between some teenage girl's legs, enjoying the nectar of youth. But the parents knew Lee Boy better than that, and they waited up all night with the front light on. But their son never returned. 
And the next day, cops were called in, and they started looking. saw him around or know of his whereabouts, if they could contact the police, obviously everything will be dealt with in the strictest confidence. I mean, that goes without saying. So if there's somebody out there who knows where Lee is, please, please give a call. Lee's last confirmed sighting was walking by a supermarket at around 2.30 in town. That was the last time he was ever seen again which confirmed he wouldn't have been able to make it to any football matches. And days became weeks, and weeks became months, months, years. But the parents still held up hope that their son would return, leaving his room the exact way it was when he'd left it. Cops brought in experts to check out every single video frame on CTV cameras in London and the surrounding areas, but still, they found nothing. How could someone vanish? Now you see him. No, you don't. Experts were baffled how he managed to avoid every camera in the city. It's not that it wasn't possible, but it was one of those things you couldn't manage it if you'd planned it. Now, without a clue, the cops had to admit that the case was cold. There had long been discussions in police headquarter canteens about gangs of pedophiles who held parties in derelict buildings and dark places, later disregarding their guests in the shallow graves. And Roy Tuttle was one of those names who regularly popped up in those conversations. Schoolboy Tuttle had disappeared almost 20 years earlier. Less than four miles away from where Lee Boxel had last been seen. Skipping the bus to save money, making an ill-advised decision to hitchhike. And he paid for it, more than a bike would have cost. And although cops were inundated by stories from rent boys and faggot snitches about parties and mansions, where kids were on the menu. Superior said it was a waste of resources. But when Tuttle's body turned up three days later in front of a mansion, it certainly got some people talking. But Tuttle wasn't the first to go missing. He was just one of the only ones to be found. And no matter how many times Superiors tried to squash it, rumors kept popping up of sex parties held by the elite, where ass pussy was the caveat. But it was in 2001, with the advancements in DNA technology, that they ran some jizz that they pulled out of Roy Tuttle through the jizz detector. A surprise, surprise. It belonged to a former 65-year-old laborer. Now that boy uh, was a Kingston grammar school boy. And he went missing on his way home from school in um, April of 1968. Having got off of the bus on his way home from school um, and was never seen again until his body was recovered, found by some forestry workers um, on the Friday, which is the 26th. Yeah. So that's the, uh, the day the boy went missing. Um, and the boy's name was Roy Lindsay Tuttle. Tuttle. T U T. I double L. Have you ever heard that name? No, no. Okay. Did you ever give any schoolboys a lift in your car at all? No. Not Lundfield had served time in the 80s for abducting and raping two other schoolboys in the same area that Lee Boxel had gone missing and was released only a month before Lee disappeared. And although he denied his murder, he came clean on Tuttle's. I'm sorry, I'm. Misled you all the time. I had been, you know, I've been to prison. I've been to prison. I'm sorry. 
But it seemed the more investigators learned from Lundfield, the less they knew. Lundfield told them, yeah, sure, there were pedophile gangs in the area, and he knew of them. But they were way above his pay grade. He'd only been a laborer. And if there were those kind of parties going on, and he wasn't saying there were, but if there were, he wasn't invited to them. And he told cops he'd never heard of Lee Boxel, not even on the six o'clock news. And then he just wanted to go to his cell and get some sleep. But it would be nine years later that a snitch would walk into that exact same police station and blow the case wide open. It was in 2012 that investigators busted a scumbag who was a purveyor of child porn. A small time operator running a backroom DVD rental shop for those with a certain proclivity. But nevertheless, he'd already been busted and done time for sodomy on a minor. So if the charge made it to court, this time, he'd need to be packing more than an overnight bag. So he wanted to know if cops wanted to cut a deal. It was then that he told them of a club, a youth club, unofficial of course, called The Shed. There was in a shed behind the church. And it was in this social club that underage kids were plied with drink and drugs. And then they were given the business by a clientele of sleaze bags, invitation only, of course, for sex parties. And although he'd never attended these parties, he'd witnessed all sorts, including one kid being bent over a tombstone, being fucked, told that it would rid him of evil spirits. And this was just the tip of the iceberg. A pedophile iceberg, a real Sodom and Gomorrah. When the cops started doing a little poking around, they realized that the social club, well, it was just down the road from where Lee had gone missing, and a little more down the road from where he lived. And I guess they'd started wondering if he'd ever attended that club. It was in 2013 that Lee would have been 40 years old and cops put out an appeal to find out if anybody'd ever been a member of the Shed Social Club. And I'm guessing they already figured that it wouldn't have been any of the adults who'd come forward. And sure enough, there was a real popular place, and victim after victim came forward with sordid tales from the Shed. And one name kept coming up, the party planner who'd been throwing those parties since the early 80s and worked as a grave digger in the cemetery. And they believed that Lee Boxel had been a guest at one of those bugger bashes, and for whatever reason, they killed him, and then stuck him in the same coffin next to one of the olden day stiffs. The police work taking place at St. Duggan's is only just visible to parishioners from the front of the church, but most local people know about the investigation. The only snag in the theory was that the church would let the cops dig deeper than six feet or disturb any of the graves. And any good grave digger knows the deeper, the better. And cadaver dogs, <laughs> they were useless as a retard with a calculator, because the place was full of stiffs. I've been piecing myself back together. When each of your words slip away, slip away I thought we would be it, we'd be forever But after the sun came the rain I know that I'm the one to blame You'd given me one too many second chances I took your heart and I held it captive I got 
got so twisted in the lies deception held too tight left you second guessing what's more depressing is i'm self destructive so supposed to love if i can help myself a little self destructive just a little just a little just a little just a little I took your heart and I held it captive I got so twisted in my lies deception held too tight left you second guessing what's more depressing Legion forever